Paul Giroux Galair, a Green Ocean, Chief Executive of Dublin City Council, Dublin City Librarian, French Embassy, and guests. I'm delighted to welcome you to the winner interview for the 2022 Dublin Literary Award, sponsored by Dublin City Council, here in the sylvan setting of Marion Square Park at the International Literature Festival. Dublin. My name is Anne-Marie Kelly, Director of the Dublin UNESCO City of Literature. And just in case you haven't heard, The Art of Losing by Alice Zeniter, translated trans from French by Irishman Frank Wynne, and nominated by the Public Library in the Pomp de Boo Centre, Paris, has won this year's Dublin Literary Award. And just to remind us again what this actually means, The Art of Losing, a family sag with themes of migration and identity, published by Picador, was selected from 79 titles by an expert panel of judges, sitting over there, chaired by Professor Chris Marash of Trinity College Dublin. These books were nominated by 94 libraries from 40 countries in the world, and 30 were in translation. The significance of having books in translation expands our reading experience beyond the Anglophone world, and the Dublin Literary Award, sponsored by Dublin City Council, is a matter of pride to us in the city because of its inclusivity. So we will hear from Nogagnon, winners now, in this interview with, aptly enough, Michael Crone, Professor of French in Trinity College Dublin and Director of the Trinity College Centre for Literary and Cultural Translation. And let us give them all a warm Dublin welcome. Uh, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, this evening's uh, interview conversation uh, with the uh, winner uh, of the uh, Dublin uh, Literary Prize uh, and the translator uh, of the uh, winning uh, novel. Um, so uh, what I would like to do, um, uh, at least to, to, to begin with, is one of the things that you kind of touched on uh, this morning when you were... Uh, acknowledging you know, the receipt of the prize uh, and, and responding to it um, was the stories that often don't get told. You know, that, you know, what, what happens um, if you're on the kind of the, the losing side of a conflict is uh, not only are you perceived to have, to have you know, uh, not won the, the conflict, uh, but often the stories get lost, lost uh, too. So did you feel in writing the art of losing, that it was all about the, the art of, of finding. You, you wanted to kind of find, find or retrieve those stories that have been uh, marginalized, neglected, uh, lost. Yes, and um, they, were, they were lost for many reasons. Uh, one of the reasons, obviously, is that is, uh, the, the story that I wanted to tell was uh, the story of people would be like a, a fiction version of my family. And my uh, grandparents, they, they couldn't read nor write. So we don't have written archives, you know, documents that can uh, back to to understand what happened. Um, and uh, and even, you know, like, uh, even if I find newspaper from then uh, that, that were published in Kabylia, it's something that I know my grandparents could not read. So, you know, how do, how I, do, how do I create uh, and how do I write a story from uh, no written base? So that was one thing. And of course, uh, uh, the other reason is that uh, the versions of this families caught in the war and who had to fled has been rewritten on both sides of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, on one side, by the new Algerian Al state, who had one version, which was, uh, there is only one hero, and it's the people. So that meant that, you know, that everyone was a fighter pro-independence. And if you weren't, were, then you were, you know, like most of the time, nothing. You didn't exist. Or if you were talked about, it was like, um, like you were a Shakespeare villain. You know, like, like everything you wanted to do in your life was to kill thousands and thousands innocent people and then laugh after. Mm. Um, and on the, 
on the French side, it was not really talked. It was, we didn't even call it a war. Uh, in the first, in the time, we didn't even, you know, like uh, acknowledge the fact that we colonized a country. So the decolonization was, of course, very complicated to deal with because uh, uh, there was no admission of the colonization in the first place. And when the people that were called the Harkis were talked about, most of the time it was by the extreme right wing as a proof that colonization was a good thing, that indigenous people loved France, that there were, were no forms of oppression at all, uh, and that basically Algeria should have stayed French. So the word that was used to call my own father was a word that was putting him in a box, box like the word belong to my uh, to my opponent mm -hmm. <laughs> on a, on the political side. So right from the story, Boris first to claim back the words that were used to name my people, but that were used actually against my people, that were used to silence my people. Mm. Uh, Frank, Frank, I mean, as as you know, the Irish uh, translator uh, of, of the the art of the art of losing. Uh, were you kind of c conscious of in, in, in translating uh, Elise Zenater's text that there were a lot of echoes, echo parallels with, with our own experiences in Ireland where there were people after independence who were deemed to have been on the wrong on side that, that had the, um, you know, a lot of the controversies around the uh, commemoration of the RIC, for example, and, and, and people who were in the, the Royal Irish Constabulary and, and how you know, uh, they were uh, deemed to kind of be, they were seen as, as traitors and disloyal. So did, did you find, you know, when you were, when you were translating the latex that, that it had maybe another dimension of, of meaning to you because of these parallels, or some parallels? I was experience. very conscious because um, my father um, was born in 1901. Um, and so... My father was so keen during the 19, the 19 rising, I think, and you know, he was there for the Free State and for the Civil War that ensued. I know um, from again, like um, the grandfather in Alice's novel, this is not something he ever talked about. But I do know that uh, during the period of the Black and Tans, um, um, he managed to um, free a number of his friends who had been um, uh, who had been taken by them. Um, he was obviously around for the Second World War and then for, for, for the Republic. And again, I mean, he died when I was 14. So it's not as though not to have had very long conversations about this. It wasn't talked about. And again, the history of Ireland from, certainly from 1922 on, has been um, one of either silence or recrimination. We have, you know, two major political parties who still exist based on where they were situated in 1922. Um, so from that point of view, but also the, the our version of history, the version of history that I learned growing up, uh, again, amassed all of the all people into one. So we had all been in favor. We had always wanted this, we this, always done this. And of course, you look at any piece of history, um, in any sort of detail, and you discover, of course, that that's not the case. Um, Ali, um, having fought um, the French um, in the Second World War, as many people in both Algeria and Morocco were obliged to do, um, felt a loyalty to them and thought that they felt a loyalty to him, um, only to be betrayed by them and also by his fellow countrymen. And, you know, when they are forced to flee in 1962 after, after independence, and, um, uh, they are told they will be warmly welcomed as citizens, but they end up in relocation camps, they end up in poor housing, they end up with no support, and then, of course, they end up being demonized by the very people who use Harki as, as you know, we should have kept Algeria, um, everyone, everyone. It's, it's, so yes, the parallels were very clear to me reading it, and I think that Alice has very beautifully captured the entire sweep of it. It's very, all too often what happens is you get a small part of the story that assumes you know the larger whole. And Alice never for a moment expects that. She tells you 
the various possible sides of the story. Mm. Elise, Elise, you were, I mean, you, 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 you've mentioned um, your family background and the, the access that people had to, to literacy and, and, and so on. And did you, were you conscious of the fact that when you were writing this story, this is both the story of your um, ancestors in Algeria and not the story of your ancestors in Algeria. In other words, um, was, there, was there tension between the freedom that you needed as a writer to imagine a story and then what's sometimes called the tyranny of fact? fact that the, um, was, did, did you feel that tension at all in writing the book? No, I think uh, my... Um, mm, my process uh, mm -hmm. of writing was quite clear and it was that I would use every tiny bit of story that I had from my family and uh, and they were not that many and they were very short and uh, sometimes they were not really believable either uh, like uh, like the story of my grandfather becoming rich because at some point uh, the the torrent brings the the olive olive press, press, press yeah. uh, and you know like it was always told in my family like family, uh, yeah like a sheer fairy tale and uh, and growing up I was believing this story but when I started to write it I was wait like the torrent couldn't could make actually the press so it was taken from someone else and my grandfather never give it back <laughs> so it's not it's not a fairy tale you know like it's uh it's actually more complicated that uh, that it sounded but so i took this time this bit and i knew that between these twin points mm. i could imagine uh things to draw the lines of fiction to conduct them and at some point um I, uh, I started to have, um, yeah, like, uh, like the whole story, more or less in, in place. And a historian friend of mine asked me uh, if I wanted to go with him to the military um, archive in Aix-en-Provence and uh, see if I could find the military record for my grandfather. And then I said no, mm. because I was writing a work of fiction mm. and I knew that at this point, if I read something, that was going against my story, I would be completely mm. yeah, like torn apart the thing that... So now, now I know the facts, but the story I want to tell, tell that, what do I do? So yeah, I said just like, I, I, uh, and I'm gonna just uh, yeah, keep going with my dots and my lines. Yeah, as you were saying there about family stories, Vivian Mercier, who was a critic here, uh, years ago once said, the more detail there is in an Irish story, the less likely it is that it's true. <laughs> <laughs> People tend to embroider. And this goes very much for, uh, for family stories as, as many other uh, stories. Um, Frank, when you were uh, translating um, Alice's um, book, um, were there particular challenges that, 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 that came up? Because you know, each book, of course, is its own specific character, um, its own way of, 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 of working and, and, and hanging together. So you know, were, were there particular uh, challenges and, and did you work with uh, uh, when you were, or, or did you kind of leave Elise alone while you <laughs> got on with the translation? Um, there, there are specific challenges in, in any book. Um, the thing with Alice's book is that actually it has multiple narrators at various times. Mm. So this is notionally the story of Naima, and Naima does have uh, her own voice in the third part of the book. Uh, it is the story of Ali and Yema and Hamid and, and, and whatever, but that is told to us in, in a third person. First. And then there, in there is not an omnipresent author, but an author who occasionally pops in to say, if I were Naima, I wouldn't have done this. If I were if Naima, I would have started my story here. I would have, you know, and that's it. Uh, you know, this is not attempting to be this sort of grand post novel, but nonetheless, you have this little voice going, who's that? And you need, you need to keep an ear for the, the multiple voices and, and to, to play them against each other. Mm -hmm. So it begins with, you know, the wonderful pageantry of, of the beginnings of, of the first um, uh, occupying invasion in, in, in 1830. 
and it uses, uh, in French, you know, um, quite a historic um, voice, and you recreate that sort of 19th century, uh, um, you know, history as it is written. I mean, one of the beautiful things that she does is to say that there are histories, plural. When you start folding them all into history, then it is, it is neither true nor believable, because actually it, 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 it takes all of the identity out of it. And so the multiple histories of Algeria, which were of Kabylia, but all, and then of the north, and also of those who were inspired by Egypt, Egypt to see, seek for independence, were all squashed into you know, a single chapter in a single book of French history, where they form a, a different function. So yes, it's, um, it was lovely to be able to do, but uh, you need to be very atten attentive to the various voices. In terms of, of collaboration, what I tend to do is finish a first draft, draft together all the questions that I have, write and say, look, these are the decisions I've made, these are the things I'm thinking, this is what I think, you know, you know um, etc. Um, it's very it's difficult to straightforwardly collaborate because the eventual version in English will be that of the translator. Mm. And um, when you're weighing up a sentence, the heft of a sentence, and whether you think it needs another syllable because it's not quite working right, it's really not fair to ask the author whether, whether this works or that doesn't work. On the other hand, there are lots of places where there is an ambiguity in the text which you cannot replicate and you need direction as to, to where you want to go. There are the tales of things that you can't know without asking. Um, and, there, and also, simply saying, this is how I've read your book, you're my right, because actually I need to be attempting to recreate the voice that I hear in my head has to be as close to the voice that she could hear when she was writing it uh, as possible. So, yes, occasionally you just look for a bit of validation. Um, uh, and you, that's, that process is ongoing. I mean, it, it happens again when, when an editor gets involved and says, um, you know, are you sure you want to do this? And so one of the editors involved, um, there is a passing reference to Tolkien. In, uh, to Lord of the Rings in the book. And the editor said, um, can we get rid of that? And I said, no, you can't get rid of that. Um, I didn't write that. Um, I'm just translating it. Could you ask Alice if we could get rid of that? No, I couldn't. <laughs> she has written and published a book. You bought the book, Tolkien Stays. So you're saying so an editorial henchman was supposed to turn up at Alice's door and have these... Uh, <laughs> it it, it happens away. more often than you would think. Um, sometimes, it's very rare, but uh, sometimes you will get editors get who look at a translation as though it were the, the manuscript for a novel. But the novel already exists. Um, all I can do is do it voice in another language. It is not my job, um, um, nor would I dare to um, start tinkering around with it. That's um, the novel. Is, novel it is. What you attempt to do as a translator is, is to bring it to, to more readers in another language. It's one of the things that's very striking in this um, work, and, and it's what one of the things that makes it so very, very memorable, um, is 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 the power of these these images? Their particular scenes, um, like when the FLN turns up in uh, Ali's village for the, for the first time, is a, a real sense of this is you know happening be, be, be before your eyes. Uh, and it, you know, is your ex your experiences as a, as a as a filmmaker does that have a role to play, or, to play? or do you think or? See writing as a kind of a, kind of a, a series of, of images in, in in your mind. Either my writing when you're reading other writers, or I mean, just this. Yeah. Um, so I think it's the first time that I'm gonna uh, answer uh, this question in English. So mm. I apologize for uh, the poor quality of language. Um, there is something. That, uh, that really annoys me when people say that there is something cinematographic about my writing, mm -hmm. because 
writings used to do that centuries before cinema was invented. It's what we did with words, uh, creating images, framing, actually you know, choosing the angle through which uh, the, the, the reader will enter a scene and then, and then you know, like opening the frame or, or uh, narrowing it instead or moving, you know, like a... Uh, like from a window to another, mm. it's um, yeah, it's it's a big quality of uh, uh, of writing. The fact that we can, can like direct the um, uh, yeah the, uh, the look uh, inside uh, inside a, a scene, and uh, the the FLN uh, apparition in the mm. village. I think what. Uh, what was striking to me when I started reading, you know, um, uh, articles and books about it was not at all uh, something that came from the cinema, but from ancient theatre. Uh, this idea that to impress the villagers, uh, when they weren't enough warriors, they would, you know, light fires around the village and have, have a few men, men walking in front of the fire, so you would see hundreds of shadows. Like that, like that's an ancient trick. Like you know, that's that's the first step of a magic show, and uh, and I wanted yeah to to build something which would have this uh, this strength, this this visions um, mm. that is yeah that is to me uh, way more powerful than the speech by the by the lieutenant, even if I worked on it. Uh, a lot as well, so that it could be, you know, be something in the same time appealing and scary, threatening, and uh, and full of the promises of uh, of independence. But what I had in mind was, yeah, this this theater, this very basic theater that is uh, uh, playing such a huge part in this war. Mm -hmm. And it's a sense in which, you know, because one of the, the the difficulties, of course. Uh, you know about the the, the region the region you're describing is it became the prisoner of particular kinds of images. I mean that whole Orientalist tradition and painting and so on, and so on. Nineteenth century, which presents uh, Algeria and Morocco and Tunisia in a particular way. So was, was there a sense to kind of use maybe particular kinds of images to do away with others or to or to challenge others? Actually, I. Uh, I used them all, uh, the, mm. all the images, like um, uh, the Orientalism is a part of my uh, literary culture because mm. like, you know, I, I'm French, I grew up reading French literature and it's everywhere mm. and it's beautiful. Mm. I mean, it has, <laughs> it has a lot of problems, of course, like a way of uh, uh, e exoticizing. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, large parts of the population and cultures and uh, but it created as well a language that is absolutely vivid and rich and uh, and I don't want to let that apart you know I know uh, uh, Kateb Yassin said uh, le français est un putain de guerre how do I, yeah, do I play yeah. that <laughs> uh, yes um, um, oh. Um, yes, putain de guerre, not quite that, but yeah. uh, yes, I suppose it is the spoils of war. French is, is, is effectively uh, created from uh, the spoils of war. So it's something, you know, like, uh, uh, like yeah, like Algeria be became an independent country, but we Algerian writers, we want to keep uh, the French language because we won it in, in the war. So the, that's what Kateb said. And I was... And I was Orientalism is something that I want to keep as well. I don't want to make myself poorer. Mm. Uh, just you know, so so this imagery I used as well. I, I try to create new images. I try to uh, I, I try to to create full characters uh, that weren't seen as uh, you know like exotic dancers basically uh, uh, in the in the novel of uh, of white French people. But in the same time, yeah, I, I use these things about the, the perfumes, the colors, and... Uh, well, the, uh, the scene particularly um, of Yema before she goes to Alice to us, 
where everything is laid in front of her and you mm -hmm. detail all of the things that are being given to give her. Um, what is for makeup, what is for perfume, what is for mm -hmm. taste, what is for whatever. And then the sort of riding through the night, you know, across, yeah. um, um, across the mountain uh, and being met. Uh, and I actually gloss very slightly in English to explain what it is. Um, so the, the standard greeting is a series of salvos fired by the menfolk when you arrive. Um, all of that has an exoticism um, to it. And all of it is, you know, I mean, you're aware that you're doing yeah, it. Yeah, but it's a perfect example because actually the, um, uh, the list of the, the trousseau. Yeah, yeah, uh, the uh, trousseau. Yeah, um, <laughs> I got it from, uh, from a book written at the end of the 19th century by, um, by, uh, by French colonizers. Uh, and there were uh, two of them, I keep forgetting the, their names, but uh, they were military officers, uh, but they were really into uh, geography and botanics, and both of them uh, spoke uh, Kabyle and Arabic, so they were sent uh, away from their military, military base to... Um, to write about the, the villages and the uh, and the, the culture and all, and they they wrote this list: what is uh, in the trousseau of a Kabylian woman getting married? And of course, it's written with this like how it's so exotic, it's so charming, it's so. But the list itself, it's beautiful, and you can see see they are amazed mm -hmm. by what they are describing. You know, like trying to get the shapes and the colors right, right uh, writing the names in the three different languages. So you know, like French, Arabic, Berberic, uh, and because the list was so well done, it was actually uh, kept on and on in the following books published about uh, Kabylia mm -hmm. in the beginning uh, of the um, of the twentieth century. Everyone is like, oh, we are going to use the list of these two guys. And I was like, well, I want to use the list of these two guys as well. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. so this scene is really like, I, I took the, the whole first material and I tried to write the story of my grandmother, grandmother's wedding mm -hmm. uh, based on a list which comes from a completely different source. Alice, did you, I mean, because, you know, reading uh, uh, part of, of, of Losing and, uh, you know, uh, comparing it to uh, earlier books, books, Godon Aubrard and uh, uh, Justevon uh, L'Oubli, I mean, they're very different kinds of, of, of books. This is a book that moves on to a very large sketch, large canvas, and going across three generations. Um, did you feel any sense of trepidation or, or fear or anxiety about this very large uh, period that you were going to describe or imagine or talk about? about. Or, or did it feel like th this was the moment to do this kind of writing? No, actually, actually it felt, it felt um, like a kind of, um, uh, I don't know, uh, like, like, a, like a crazy, crazy hunger. I mean, from the... So first, I thought that it would be a book I would write um, uh, later. I thought, you know, like uh, I don't know, I don't would be fifty or something that it would be the book of my um, um, purity. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and I started writing a few bits here and there, and uh, and reading story books at the same time and uh, sociology sociology books as well. And and then suddenly I wanted to incorporate everything. In uh, in the book, so you know it. You know, uh, uh, yeah. I wanted to talk about this and this and this and uh, uh, and yeah. The the book kept growing, mm -hmm. but it it wasn't scary at all because it was uh, yeah. It was a uh, more like a like a happy frenzy, because I came from this uh, uh, silent uh, uh, silent story, and then suddenly I was oh, okay. If I start telling the story, then I need to need everything. Mm. Uh, so this is why, as Frank said, you know, like you have these different voices, and then uh, you 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 start with uh, um, the the first colonization in 1830, but then you you know you you go to to Paris in uh, in 2020, and then then and this is why uh, as well the. Um, uh, my eye as a novelist is here, here because uh, I, I felt I was really, uh, 
I was really dancing with all these elements around me. And, uh, and I somehow, I don't know, I felt uh, I needed to put myself in it as, um, as the puppet master. Uh, to show that I was building a novel from all these different uh, sources and materials and, uh, and to say this is not something that I can, you know, or this is not something that Naima could tell as the granddaughter of this family. This is something that I can do because I'm in a frenzy of frenzy of thing and, uh, and I'm playing play with uh, everything that I can, that I can. so yeah. Uh, but also the pleasantfulness of the tone, and particularly of the of the author who occasionally intervenes, um, softens that. There is no sense in the novel that this is the story. This is a story. This is one story. There is a lovely point when Naima says, "It is a terrible thing um, when everything that you know about, about about your country is shorter than the Wikipedia article," yeah. um, and that playfulness of acknowledging what you know and what you don't know and making it very clear how you're finding out and when you're finding out. Mm -hmm. It also makes it extraordinarily uh, easier for non-French readers, French uh, um, readers of a translation who have no sense of this because even if you weren't alive during um, the Angerial War of Independence, it looms, um, you know, it is something that everyone will have some idea of this takes nothing for granted and so it by picking pieces here and there in a sort of magpie like fashion um it rather wonderfully creates this collage but also telling you what to do so there were a couple of points you know in the translation where uh, editors said well should we gloss this or you know should you know should we insert a little thing so that people know what it is i said no naima is here you know on wikipedia all the day you know <laughs> trying to find out stuff they can do it, you know, if she can do it, they can do it. And I think that was important. It, it liberated me from not having to explicitly spell out that, you know, this is the FN and the, this is the, um, you know, these are the good guys, these are the bad guys, but actually they think that it's, the, you know, you, you're no longer trying to fill in historical detail for people who won't know it mm. because we've already been told, oh, and do your research. One of the things, um, uh, at least that you, you kind of touched on this morning, you know, um, in your 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 speech, uh, was you know why writing becomes so important at particular moments. Um, um, and I mean, you know, your book comes out in France, La Belle, in 2017, and, um, and you know, in the intervening period, a lot of things happened in, 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 in French politics. We we saw what happened in, in the recent in the elections. Um, and I mean, do you sense that that what you described a bit earlier of, of kind of restoring complexity to people's lives, getting behind or getting beyond labels, that that takes some, an even greater urgency in particular contexts, uh, whether it was the war in the Ukraine, the rise of strong uh, man politics, you know, the rise of populism and so on. Yeah, yeah, and I think one thing of the reason that terrible things can happen in politics is that uh, um, a part of the population can have no empathy and absolutely no representation or just bad representation of another part of the population. And it's something that even in our modern days and times with, uh, you know, all these things we, we, we tell ourselves about so social networks and all of that, it's still happening. I mean, um, and there are groups of people who live with absolutely no knowledge of w how the next group is living, you know, what do they do, how do they live. Um, and, uh, and because of that, uh, they can think the worst of the other groups and they can let some laws be imposed as well, thinking like, you know, how, you know why should I care? Mm. Uh, it's not me that they're looking at, so uh, let's, let's do it. Let's, let's, um, and I think that somehow, even if it's limited, and even if, yeah, we, we know it like reading is uh, uh, still more or less a, a, a bourgeois 
uh, pratique, like it's not, it's not well shared uh, socially. But still, I have the hope that reading a novel, uh, reading fiction, it can make you connect with some characters that you will never meet in, uh, in the real world. It will, you know, it builds bridges between groups that don't, uh, that, that don't know each other. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they can, you know, make some characters so close to you that if that hear a politician next time saying like, yeah, well, I think like all the all people should be re migrates I don't know how you say that in uh, in English, uh, or that they don't deserve social housing, or they don't deserve uh, medical cover, or they don't. Then you will think that it's some real people that will be affected by that. Pe you know, people who are not that different from you. People you you felt you felt empathy for, for while you were reading a book. A book and. Yeah, somehow I keep hoping that it helps. Mm. Frank, I mean, do you see, I mean, uh, the role of translation in development, that kind of uh, empathetic imagination? I mean, in your anthology found in translation, uh, you talked about translation as kind of the beating heart of world, of world literature. But is, is, is it also so a kind of a, 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 a beating heart with a kind of an ethical pr dimension to it? I mean, that. It is an ethical adventure. There is an ethical dimension to it, but I, but um, I get worried when people start thinking of literature in, in translation as like cod liquor oil. You know, you take it because it's good for you, but you're not expecting to enjoy it. Um, um, but yes, of course, there's a part of that. Of that. What you have just said and what Alice has just said. Um, Strongman politics and nationalism are fueled by simple stories. You take out all the complexity, you take out all of the backstory, you reduce people to archetypes or to stereotypes, and then it's that easy to pit pit us against them and them against you know and us together against someone else. The moment you have complex characters, the moment you get to know people. Um, you realise that actually it's all a little bit more complicated than that, and that the humanity there is is more is that. One of the things that does worry me occasionally about translation uh, is that, particularly in the anglophone world, what we want, what certainly what certain publishers want and some readers want, is they want it to want to explain the world for them. So, you're a writer from Spain. I'd need you to write about the, the the civil war. I wasn't alive. That well, just write about it anyway. Oh, you're from Rwanda. Could you do something about the genocide? Gen um, and you get you this sort of thing where what we're really asking is for someone. Could you just like slice your entire culture into a charming little novel? And that is not what literature is for either. I, um, it's for whatever stories um, authors choose to tell. But you will get, yeah. I, there's a wonderful author called Patricia Pron, who I've tried to have published in, in the, the United Kingdom, and people say, well, you know, Patricia Pron is writing in Spanish, but he's writing about Germany. But he lives in Germany. He's lived in Germany for like 30 years. You know, why wouldn't he be writing about Germany? Yeah, but I mean, it's really difficult to sell that. But somehow it's somehow difficult to sell David Peace writing about Tokyo or, you know. Um, people's imaginations should be free. But yes, yes translation, more than anything, um, uh, produces us to the minds of other people mm -hmm. rather than the picture postcard, this is what it looks like, or this is the harrowing you know, um, story they have to tell, or this is the uplifting story they have to tell. Mm -hmm. um, all human beings are more complex than that. And I think what translation does uh, and what literature and translation does both going from English into other languages and, and vice versa, is it says it's the, who we are, are as writers, as people, as characters. These are the people we've imagined. We're all kind of alike. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there was a, a report recently by the British Council on you know why certain kinds of literatures get translated and, and others don't. And one of the things that the view of um, the translators from Turkish, from Hebrew and Arabic were complaining about, about is that, that people were treating literature as a branch of political science or sociology. Yep. It's basically to kind of explain, you know, what, what yeah. they, uh, these... Um, uh, at least, do you, do, you, do you get that sense sometimes that you've been boxed into a corner, that, that people expect you to speak about particular things and to become a kind of a porte-parole or a spokesperson for, for things in, in particular ways? Yeah, 
all the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all the time. Uh, it's and it's. Uh, uh, I mean, obviously, with the with the art of losing, uh, I I felt it um, a great deal. It's like um, I was uh, I was writing a piece recently, and I um, and I read the articles and the reviews uh, that got published when uh, the book went out in uh, 2017, and. I'm uh, I'm praised for actually doing a social work, uh, so you know, so for for putting a subject back in the public discussion, for uh, you know this formula that is used all the time, like a, uh, giving giving dignity back to the people, blah 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 blah. It's, it's for I don't know, like nine novels out of ten. It's ridiculous. I think everyone should have dignity back back now because apparently <laughs> it uh, saves you the, the problem of having to do it. <laughs> uh, and and so yeah, uh, it's 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 um, it's um, thing that I wanted to do as well, of course, with the with the novel, but. It seems to be like the, the biggest thing that it's talked about, and it's um, it's educational uh, work, mm. uh, and uh, and yeah, and I realized re reading interviews that uh, um, during the year during the publication, I talked more about Algeria, a country in which I spent three weeks in my whole in my life, mm. that I've been talking about talking literature about this book. <laughs> Literature, which is something I dedicated 20 years of my life to. So, so yeah, it's a, it's a weird thing. And then, of course, for the following years, I was really anxious that I would be trapped in this, uh, in this subject, that people would want me to, uh, to, to talk about Algeria on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's, it's what's part of my story. Uh, there is thousand stories that I wanna I wanna tell, mm. and, uh, and 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 I, yeah, I don't want to be uh, caught in the nostalgia yeah. uh, talking uh, about earlier. Mm. So yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it's tricky. Yes, tell me it's there. Um, we have described it as a conversation, and of course, uh, it's not just a conversation between the three of us. Uh, we want to uh, uh, have uh, uh, everyone else uh, involved in the conversation. So, um, if anyone has um, a question uh, or a common form, um, I think there's a gentleman at the back there. Yeah. Uh, do we have a microphone? Uh, the only thing I'd ask you to keep ask questions relatively short, relatively good. Just get everybody a chance to, to take part. Thank you, and uh, well done, Elise, and congratulations. Thank you. Um, and to you, uh, Frank. My Thank question you. really is about um, authorship. And you've spoken about your role, Frank, and yes, you've kind of said, look, it's, it's Elise's uh, work. However, you've also said, and quite rightly, that the audience are going to be hearing your voice, and it's, a, it's an area of an interest lately about how many people are involved in a work, in a work and that work is a great example of that. So is it Elisa's work? Is it, is it your work to some extent? Are we hearing the voices of two French uh, 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 military officers from years and years ago? Are your editors involved? Is the publisher involved? And, and that sort of group authorship idea, it's very interesting as you've been talking about this. I wonder what you both think about that. Well, Alice, um, in her acceptance speech um, earlier, er, thanked her editors and those people who had read this at a formative stage, and they will have played a role in what they did. Um, the collaborative role between us uh, is another one. My role with my editors who were, there were three editors and a copy and editor, all have influenced um, uh, the English version. There are also versions in Hungarian, in German, in Italian, in Spanish, all of which are different, but all of which are, to some extent, performing Alice's, te uh, Alice's text in their language. Um, one of the things that occasionally brought up about Translation in particular, as people will say, oh, well, you know, um, 
many people could try to write this book, but only one person could have written it. And this is absolutely true. But each and every translator would have given you a different book at the end of it. They have no choice. Um, the fact that many people can pay, play Bach's Goldberg variations does not mean you want to come to my house and listen to me try. <laughs> um, and there is a f huge difference between what Rosalind Turek does or what Glenn Gordon does or what Murray, Pur Murray does or what Keith, Keith Jarrett does. So in a sense, what the English translation, the book that, that has been uh, received the award today is, is it is my book, absolutely. Uh, but it is also Alice's book, absolutely. And there have been a whole bunch of other people uh, who have been involved, some directly involved in this text, and others more directly in terms of how I came to be a translator and the sort of translator that I am, and also kind of everything I've ever read, ever, and then everything she's ever read, ever. Um, it's all very complicated. Yeah, for, for me, the, the book, even before uh, Frank's translation, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's made of brain, brain of, uh, of languages, and, uh, and clearly, not all of them are mine, like far, far, far from that. Uh, for example, I've been reading uh, uh, a lot the works uh, of uh, Abdel Malek Sayad, who is a, a sociologue, he was a, a close friend of uh, Bourdieu. Um, and, uh, and Sayad uh, wrote a book about uh, uh, Algerian immigration in, in France, which is called uh, uh, La Double Absence, so Double Absence. Um, and uh, and he chose to translate his uh, his interviews with uh, the people uh, uh, he worked with in a um, in a kind of a literal translation. So keeping the uh, the grammar or the the, um, the expressions from Arabic and from Kabyle, and so it gives a really really weird language, a language that. I had not read before, and uh, and reading uh, his books, I was, was yeah, I was thinking, oh, that's that's fascinating, and I want to use some of these tricks, so I'm kind of using Syed's voice, using the people uh, he's interviewing, so that's already probably 50 different people that uh, I uh, inco incorporate within the book, uh, and then. Uh, yeah, and then it keeps, you know, it keeps going. So, like uh, for example, the, um, uh, Naima's roommate in the novel, she's based based on a, a real friend of mine, uh, Saul, who is a war reporter, uh, and uh, and use some of her expressions, way of talking, and uh, uh, and when I told Saul that I, I got this prize today, she was like, "Oh, I won a prize!" prize. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, and yeah, I, I understand why she says that. You know, like that's her book as well. Some somehow she's in it. Her voice is uh, is in it. So, yeah, we, we are we are all several uh, several voices. But I am the puppet master, as I said. So you know, it's not. It's, oh, and uh, yeah, one of the one I wanted to add is that sometimes, like you know. Right now, right, I'm just quoting what voice I can think of, and they you know, like they were more or less more like a conscious part of my work. But in 2018, uh, I went to this class in a university in Lyon, and uh, the students, uh, like they were uh, PhD students in literature, and they had worked on my, uh, my, on my book. And uh, uh, a couple of them did uh, talk about, about the Orientalism in my book. And they picked three sentences that were, were from an opera on Sanson and Delilah, and they are exact quotes. I have never heard this opera. I have never read the libretto. But I know that no, I didn't. Then you know, it's not possible that I completely invent these sentences, and they are exactly the same. So they reached me. I don't know how, and they slept in a corner of my memory, but what I wanted to write about dawn and the end of, a, you know, the end of a great feast and the sunrise behind the mountain, the mountain, these sentences came back. And they're not my voice. They're one of the thousand voices that I have that I have in my head when I, uh, when I write. 
Uh, I just hide at least that you've you've banked that check because that big <laughs> see all these all these you know, rushing towards the Crédit Lyonnais uh, <laughs> looking for their, their tokens worth in the front. The entire Elizabeth Bishop poem is, is towards the end. It's very, very deliberate. Um, um, in fact, all, all but the last um, of the Elizabeth of the Bishop appears um, shortly before the end. And it is very much because what Alice we're talking about is uh, about language and loss and a sense of homeland and loss. Um, so it's, and again, it's one of the rather beautifully playful things in that um, it's quoted to her by a young Algerian man um, as uh, to, to Naima as uh, he's driving he's her back to the airport. The airport. Um. Can I just say that we've got the Not freely, really. Uh, not freely because um, there was a few, few uh, there was a few reviews, but uh, they they are not, you know, like a, I don't know. Uh, they have nothing much to to talk about, uh, and uh, and uh, the thing is that um, it wasn't republished in uh, in Algeria like. Uh, some French books are, which uh, allows them to be cheaper. cheaper. Uh, my my book has been sold in Algeria as a French book that makes it freely expensive, and uh, and that means that the people who bought it uh, they're like the educated elite already, and uh, and they're most likely to know already what I'm talking about. Uh, I, I didn't get the, the chance to reach uh, a bigger readership. Um. There was a gentleman back there, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, Could you take the, the microphone? Yeah, so everybody can hear you. Great, great. So I'd like to congratulate you on the, on the prize. Thank you. Uh, it's a big pleasure to be listening to you. Very inspirational for, I mean, young people trying to be writers someday. You know, um, I know that uh, it's uh, somehow something between a fiction and the uh, stories that you listen to from your family and everything. Uh, and I know that it's it really like you don't want to be caught in the into the you know trying to be uh, really deep into the historical things. But I reckon if uh, it has some kind of a documental side to the story, or how did you approach, uh, I mean, uh, the entire war history, or the place itself, the places that it take, take uh, that the story uh, happens in, and everything. The, uh, I reckon that if you like, like try to, you're sewing the story between the different stories you had from your family. You often go through the historical facts that happened and then you know so this took place in this time and then so maybe my grandmother could be there you know and spot that and see that thing happening uh, so how did you what was the process around that well uh, it's a bit what you what you described uh, I uh, yeah I had um, I had all this uh, Historical documents and uh, and books and uh, um, sometimes uh, like you know like a, like a very short uh, uh, film clips about uh, demonstrations or or this kind of things and uh, uh, and yeah and um, and I die to uh, I try to have my my actors make their way for that and I was wondering like you know like oh would I have uh, would they have seen that, or could they could they have heard about this thing? Or and uh, uh, yeah, I hope like you're not gonna take the the prize back uh, after hearing <laughs> that. But at some some point, I think like 
I, I pushed it in a kind of too clumsy way. Like I really wanted to talk about uh, the attack at the milk bar in Algiers. And I knew that my grandfather, at some point, he, he bought a small flat in Algiers, so he probably uh, would have gone, you know, back and forth, and forth between the mountain, the mountain and, the, and the capital. So that was not as completely, you know, out of the blue to put him there. But still, still, I kind of felt, I kind of felt bad because because I could see that was really like a trick from a writer being like, yeah, so he goes to Algiers and, uh, and uh, oh yeah. It's going to be right on the day that there is the attack, and that after that you will have the Battle of Algiers, and the, and the, yeah, the city becomes this this war zone, um, and uh, yeah, that's that's not the, um, that's not very elegant. I hope that the rest I put my characters, you know, in in subtle ways uh, through some events that uh, they could. We have uh, witnessed. You had you had great uh, precedence because Ponte Corvo, when he was fil filming the Battle yeah. of the Bajiers, did exactly the same. The same. It's like you people come over there and pretend to die. I'm sorry, we've we've been through you know a devastating siege and war here, and you know, but nonetheless there is a realism to what he's attempting to do, which is extraordinarily beautiful and communicated. Uh, certainly in France at the time, um, what uh, the Battle of Algiers was like. But again, he was weaving a form of fiction through history in order to tell a greater truth. Uh, one of the great things that fiction does is uses lies to tell truth. I can just take one more question, um, because uh, here, yeah, front. Just wait for the, the lady here in the second row. Yeah. Okay, right, well, <laughs> we're trying... It's trying. a very quick question. I just wanted to know, and forgive me if you don't want to answer, how your family felt about, your extended family felt about being autofictioned in this way. <laughs> it's the obvious. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I mean, you know, like my family is so first. My family is a big family. Uh, uh, there are different people. Not not everyone is uh, is taking the thing in the in the, in the way. They're okay, more or less. Some of them are, are really proud. Some of them feel a bit uncomfortable. Uh, but what I what I love is the fact that. Uh, Grandmother, so because we cannot uh, cannot read the book, she actually she actually has a fiction of what the fiction is, <laughs> because some of my uncles and aunts aunts they talk bits bit, and then she's inventing the book in her head, uh, and she seems to be really happy with the fiction of my fiction she has, so uh, it's for the best. That that sounds like a great answer to this. This here in the, fr the front row, I wish. Thank you. My question was for Frank in relation to the translation. I need to understand this. So, you guys, you both have, are the winners of the award. But mm -hmm. you are saying, I just quoting you, this is from the, the RT saying that obviously um, the fact that this is a translation into English makes this possible as well as we consider as a winner. I just need to understand. So. The novel was written in French, and you translated it into English, and you both are co-winners of the award. Yes. And then you say as well that you are really thankful to the, obviously, the Dublin Literature Award, because it comes to this, you can continue with your translation. So my question was to do more with funding, and how are you kind of, I suppose, um, able to continue with this work? Is just is thanks to this type of awards, or is there any, any other um, grants for, for translators? Or There are... Thank you. The way you survive as a translator is you translate about five books a year because otherwise you starve. Um, translators are paid. You know, I am. I I'd started doing this 20 years ago, just over 20 years ago. Uh, I am still paid what more or less more the other translator translating from any language into English is paid. There are grants. They are generally given to publishers to facilitate the publication of a translation. There are 
agencies which will fund you, fund you go somewhere while you're working on a translation. Those can be hugely helpful. There are a number of prizes that you can win, um, two of which, of which this are sufficiently considered and simple that you know, I could go home now and not bother translating the other three books that I'm supposed to be doing this year. <laughs> um, but um, broadly speaking, speak, um, uh, it is the passion of translators taking books to publishers, publishers or editors deciding to publish them, and deciding to risk their money doing it. But they do precisely that every day, every when they buy a novel, you know, written in English, or a French publisher buying a novel written in, you know, they look at the novel, they think, okay, yes, I think this is a wonderful novel. I think I can bring this novel to readers, and in that way, that will that will pay it back. Thankfully, they do not get a share of any of my prize money. <laughs> but then again, they've never given me a share of any of their grant money. <laughs> So I, so I think on, on that note, then we'll, we, we'll end our conversation this evening. But I think on behalf of everybody here, here uh, I would uh, sincerely like to thank Alice uh, Seniter and Frank, Frank uh, Wynn for uh, a fascinating insight into the creative and recreative uh, uh, process. Um, and you get some idea of uh, why both of them are such uh, worthy uh, winners uh, of this this prize. And from both uh, Alice and, and Frank, uh, we look forward to, to further works. And to thank you all as well uh, for coming along here uh, this evening. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you.